The state threatens to close low-performing schools. The federal emergency is over in Flint. A local group restores art in the classroom and 14 years of construction on I-75. Stay put. My week starts right now. Did you know Gordon Food Service was started by a 23-year-old entrepreneur as a butter and egg delivery business more than a century ago. In 1948, school teacher Gerard Wendell Hayworth borrowed $10,000 from his parents to start a woodworking operation in his family's garage. It's now Hayworth Incorporated. These are just some of the ways Michigan's pioneers started out as small companies with big ideas. We are business leaders for Michigan. We are committed to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Funding is also provided by Delta. Hi there and welcome to My Week. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm Christy McDonald. You know, summer is winding down. The back to school ads have started and this coming school year promised to be a major test for some Michigan schools because the state is getting tough on schools that aren't making the grade, saying that they are at risk of being shut down. Coming up, we're going to take a look at the criteria the school reform office is using to determine which schools should close. Is it fair? Also, Flint's water crisis is no longer a federal emergency, but the work is far from over. We'll talk about what has changed and what still needs fixing. Plus, a group brings art classes back to Detroit schools. We will have a special report on that. And the story's making headlines. Trump stumps in Michigan again. And a 14-year construction project begins on I-75. That is all coming up for you. But we do start tonight with Michigan's failing schools. The state's reform office has put chronically low-performing schools on notice. Either shape up or face the possibility of being shut down by next summer. The reform office says the targeted schools have been failing for the past 8 to 12 years. Let's bring in our Myra contributor. Is now Nolan Finley from the Detroit News and joining us again this week while Stephen Henderson is away, Nancy Kaffer, a columnist for the Detroit Free Press. Nance, welcome back. Nolan, it's good to see you as always. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, uh, we are heading towards the back to school time of year, much too. I, I know that parents are cheering out there. Two weeks too late. Kids, <laughs> kids are saying, no, no, summer not over yet. Um, but it really does bring to um, the conversation and what we saw some news coming out this week about uh, the state, the school reform office and then the Michigan Department of Education and what seems to be a very wide gap in between the two and how they're operating when it comes to when it comes to failing yeah. schools. You know, Nancy, I'm going to start with you when you see the news from the reform office saying, well, now we're going to take a look and we might start to shut some schools down and we're going to take into consideration the criteria, which would be the new MSTEP um, test results. So they haven't even gotten back. A lot of schools haven't gotten those re test results back yet. When the Department of Education said, you know, what, we're going to wait a couple years for this to uh, test to take hold before we start using it in, in any kind of um, you know, evaluations. What do you make of that and that gap between two offices there? Well, the school reform office is in is underneath the governor. The, the state uh, Department of Education has an, an independently elected board. So this is, it is literally a separation. You see one office doing stuff um, at the behest of the administration, another office doing stuff uh, under the guidance of an elected board. I mean, I, I think, you know, we come back to this central problem with uh, what you said in the intro, uh, the schools have time to either shape up or be closed. So the devil's always in the details, right? So the question is, when we tell schools they have to shape up or face closure, what are we doing to help them shape up? You can't just say to a failing school, um, got to get better. You don't get any more resources. You don't get any more training, any more equipment, any more material help to fix your buildings, any more um, you know, resources to help kids who are low performing, um, any more salary to pay more qualified teachers. You just have to get better. I mean, that doesn't, that's not really a viable uh, plan for improvement. And the other thing is when we talk about closing failing schools, what are we replacing them with? Are, are, we, are we saying, okay, so we're gonna close this failing school that you're in and you're gonna go to this other school that's maybe not failing quite so badly that's sort of near you? Are they gonna replace them with a better alternative? It, it's, there has to be, um, these are things that are very easy to say, uh, fix, you know, get better or close, mm -hmm. um, but how do you make any of that happen? Are we missing details on this, Nolan? Yeah, I mean, the school, the school reform office has been negligent in its job. Um, we've been continuously frustrated that it hasn't moved to close schools that should close. There are 40,000 extra school seats in the city of Detroit. There's 40 schools on this list of failing schools that should be closed. I think it's 32 public schools, eight charters. 
they should go now because the district doesn't have the resources to sustain this infrastructure, this, uh, this overcapacity. And if you could shrink down as quickly as possible, if you could identify the schools that are failing are, and probably aren't going to get better and shrink them down, you've got more resources to put in viable schools. That was my problem from the beginning with the EAA. When you have an overcapacity of schools, why take the 15 worse and try to make them better. Why not take those 15 and shut them down and try to make the next group better? So and you the a, office has been, I think, remiss uh, throughout its, its, its history. But don't you then have a transportation problem where you have a geographic problem with a, a lot of kids who maybe then, if you take that neighborhood school, you say, we're going to shut it down. It goes to what Nancy was saying, then what do you do next for them? It, exactly. I mean, you can't just say shut it down. We're talking about a city where there's a large percentage of people who don't have cars, where public transportation doesn't work the way it should. Um, it's not a matter of just, oh, we're going to close this and then you're going to go to an amazing school. The other thing that I think the trap that people fall into here is we talk about the school as though it's an entity independent from the people who teach in it and the kids who go to it and the resources from the community around it, the resources it has to, to use to, to educate children. So, I mean, you take the, that school that's failing and you get rid of that school that's failing, well, you still have, you know, X number of children who have been in that failing school who are going to go to other schools. It, does being in a different building somehow magically change their circumstances? But Detroit, I mean, what's, the, what's the thing that happens that, that once you get rid of that school, what's the alchemy that turns, that turns us into a successful and proposition? The, and the trans transportation issue and the location issue is, is, a serious, is a serious problem, but there are enough buildings uh, I mean, you, when you when you close a skill school, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to close a building. You could close the schools that need to be fa failing, and then reallocate the resources, the teachers, um, into an, a, a ge geographic network that makes sense, or bring in new operators. But, but you can't continue to maintain twice as many seats in a school district than you have children. I think it's also, um, you know, I think also we need to look at this this widening gap, and, and Nancy, you talked about it in terms of you have a, um, an office that's under the control of the governor, and then you have the Michigan Department of Education. And, you know, what parents are wondering, when you hear something coming out of the Michigan Department of Education, why do you need to even bother paying attention to that, knowing that the school reform office, they're the ones that are going to be enacting some kind of closure. And as a parent, when you hear, um, you know, last year our kids took the M steps, um, and, you know, we're waiting for these results and we heard from the you know education department don't worry it's gonna be this first year we're really really not going to use these results as, as any kind of test and now you have the form office saying well we're gonna use whatever we data we have for the last, then last you didn't three get years them to January yeah oh. and, and I think that that's um, I think that's the what's the troubling gap here so it, it, it that is troubling and, it, and it's um, you know unclear if it's even really fair once you have a new set of more rigorous standards the new test measures performance um, on those standards or whether or not kids are learning uh, to meet those standards, um, you have to give teachers time to kind of ramp up. I mean, obviously some of these schools as the CEO of the, or the head of the school reform office will say have been failing for a decade. Um, right, and, and will one year make a difference? But, but the, the, other thing, the other thing that we have to think about um, in terms of, of the standards that kids are learning to is, is once again, if you move people to a different school, how's that gonna change? But the other thing with the governance that we have here is so we have now, Let's count the ways we have at the state level to intervene in failing school right. districts. We have emergency managers, which I think have not really shown to work. You know in school districts. I think they're particularly ill-suited to work in school districts. We have the school reform office, which can appoint CEOs to run school districts, um, which is not quite an emergency manager, but they have power over things separate from the superintendent. Yeah. You have all these sort of dodges to try to have top-down intervention in school districts. Most research shows that bottom-up intervention works better, but also it all is a way to get around this idea that somehow if you just pay more scrutiny and have someone who's better at looking at the books, you have someone who's more more in charge, things are going to magically get better. What they need is resources. One right, of the, last word on this, Nolan. Yeah, one of the problems we have in Michigan, I mean, this is a unique, a fairly unique setup. Most states don't have both a governor, governor in charge of education and an elected school board in charge of education and sort of no, not much cooperation between them. In most states, in one way or the, the other, the elected governor is in charge of the schools, and we keep trying to work around our structural problems and this is a core issue we're never going to get um, unity on education reform as long as you have these two competing entities going after each other. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Turning now to Flint, the federal emergency has been lifted now that the water quality has improved, but at the same time, another case of Legionnaire's disease has been confirmed in the county. The end of the federal emergency means the burden shifts back to the state now to pay for bottled waters, 
filtered other supplies. Noel, let me start with you because I know that you just spent some time up yeah. in Flint. Mm -hmm. um, and, and give us an, an idea, a sense of, of how things are going. Well, you know, I was surprised when I went up there. I went up there, talked to the mayor, and talked to the business community, and we spent all day looking around the city. And I thought, you know, you were going to, I was, I expected to see sort of a desperate, depressed city. And I, it wasn't that at all. I mean, there were cranes all over downtown putting in new apartments, new lofts, new cultural center, uh, restoring historic buildings. There's a lot of energy there, a lot of hope there. And, you know, homes are starting to move. Home prices are starting to move up. There was a real sense of optimism and faith in the future, but both the mayor and the business folks uh, agreed that the only way we're, they're going to jump that final hur hurdle and put all of this behind them is to rip up every piece of line and replace it, whether it needs to be or not, because otherwise investors aren't going to have trust, residents aren't going to have trust, and it's just a matter of can you trust these lines. And I didn't, I didn't find anybody up there who didn't agree that the solution was damn the cost, we got to tear this out and, and put it back in. All right, well, you can say damn the cost, but we're only, there's only $25 million from the state so it's a, far. It's a quarter to, billion dollar effort. It, you know, so Nancy, you agree that that's pretty much what's going to happen because we still think about this. Today in August, there are people that still are not drinking out of their tap in Flint. And this is two and a half years after they switched their water supply. It's almost a year since the state acknowledged that there was a problem with the water and, and the most recent round of water testing showed that things were moving in the right direction, but you know the water still isn't, isn't safe to drink. So this is a huge, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't imagine living um, without usable water in my tap for this long. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that I've had the same experience with talking to people in Flint. There seems to be just a, a unanimous sentiment that the pipes have to be replaced. Um, and it's going to fall on the state to make this right because this is the state's um, They're going to have to bond it out. It's, all a, over. it's about a quarter billion mm -hmm. dollar job. They're just going to have to bond it out because you, even if it comes back testing consistently, no lead, no lead, no lead, these that, folks now don't people, trust people aren't gonna why, People aren't going to believe. And so why should, right. they, and should, why they, should they And that's a great question. But are, is, is the political will there to say, you know what, yep, we got to do this. Here's the money. We're going to bond it out and do it. I mean, that's what we'll see. I right. think, um, the, you know, it's an essential step or you're going to have to, that you're going to have to pay one way or the other. You're going to have to keep this city on yeah. life support and, forever if and, you don't and I do think, that. I think that people around the state need to understand that this isn't a thing about, um, you know, we get focused on the fact that there's a lot of people in Flint who live in poverty or that a lot of people who live in the city are African American. This is a city in Michigan. This is a city filled with 100,000 Michiganders. And this is this could happen. How the state treats Flint um, should be a benchmark for everyone on how the state will treat your community if something happens there. This isn't, you know, let's not get hung up on the demographics. This is a city in Michigan where people have been massively failed by the state, where their water isn't safe to drink. So if, if the state can't make that right, we all have to understand that this is this is important. And it's yeah. a far, far more viable place than people might think. I yeah. mean, this is not a place you can just write off. They've yeah. got a lot of energy there and a lot of enthusiasm. All right, it's time now for some headlines. All right, other things we're looking at this week. In election news, Donald Trump heads back to Michigan this week. Former Governor Jennifer Granholm takes on a bigger role in the Clinton campaign. And for drivers in Oakland County, be prepared for your time on I-75 to stink for the next 14 years. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at the election news first. Um, I don't know if uh, Donald Trump and his people watched our show last week, but I think we were talking about pretty much that he doesn't really have a shot in Michigan. Why is he coming back? Nolan, let me ask you first. He must see something. The campaign must see something that we're not seeing in our polls. They should have watched our show. Could have uh, watched our show last week. Or you <laughs> you, would, um, you would think they would be places, um, but at this point, you know, they're not, they're not that many places where they are competitive. So I think, you know, they're starting from scratch and seeing what they can do. They've really got a couple weeks, you know, between now and Labor Day um, to get this thing on a different course. And so I think, you know, they're going to Pennsylvania, which is numbers are as bad for him as Michigan's, and, and they're, you know, seeing if they can't. Uh, turn it around. Throwing stuff at the wall, see if it sticks. Let's keep in mind this is a guy who didn't he tell, wasn't it? Didn't he tell Call Rove a few months ago he thought he was competitive in Oregon? I mean, this is a guy who isn't competitive most places. And he I believes that, in himself. But, but well, he but, does have a little bit of ego. Eh? But in uh, in Michigan and Pennsylvania, he at least has a narrative that he can push. Um, that you know the, the the trade thing, which has been a big part of of his shtick. Um, at least um, he he. he you can make a case that there's a case to be made here for those things, whether it's successful or not. It's probably why he's looking at Michigan. But mm -hmm. I think yeah, he's I looking at places where Bernie Sanders won or did yeah. well and thinking he can 
sort of capture that same yeah. um, mm -hmm. resentment, anger, frustration, whatever. Which, interesting, um, Jennifer Granholm taking on uh, the, uh, leading a transition team for Hillary Clinton, should she make it into office? So uh, what kind of job do you think Jennifer Granholm could get in the administration should Hillary Clinton win? One never knows. I mean, everybody's, uh, that's, that's always the game. I heard this week people speculating that Mike Duggan might go into the, to the um, Clinton administration very, very well may, but that's, that's the favorite game in advance of a um, of a new president coming in is all the people who are who's going to get who's going to get, get big picks. jobs yeah and who's going to get a good job I, I I've only lived here since uh, 2000 but I remember every every presidential campaign people have talked about what governor might go do and what administration or whether or not they'd run for president or be tapped for vice president mm -hmm. this is everybody's yeah this is everybody's favorite game. Yeah. It may mean something or it may mean nothing. may mean nothing. All right, um, let's not do the math, but I'm going to be really old by the time I-75 is fixed in 2030. Um, I, this is, to me, this project still boggles the mind, and I don't think um, anyone's quite wrapped his head or, or heads around it. Um, Nancy, where will what will happen to you by the time uh, this will be done? My child will have graduated from high school, um, <laughs> hopefully have started college. Uh, I will be uh, really close to Social Security eligibility. Nolan. My hearse will roll very smoothly up to uh, 70 Well, hopefully we get a couple extra people in there so we can get the you know, HOV lane for... You're uh, investing for your grandchildren, you know, smooth roads for your well, grandchildren. Well, but it's, you know. a, it's, a, it's the wrong place to be investing. And that's what I think is still the argument that people have transit. at transit. We well, I mean, investing. If we want to clear congestion on the road, you've yeah. got to invest, the you gotta invest yeah. in reality. And the reality is we built a whole lot of freeways here when other people were building trains and subways, and now we've got to make... That's what we've got in the way of mass transit. And we've got to make it work. Well, we can play catch up and no, try yeah. to put money behind building a better system. Except yeah. there isn't the money to build a a new transit system or new subway or train system today. Those are largely federally funded projects. Okay. Yeah, well, and that bus rapid fund transit. is empty. But we got yeah. this bus rapid transit thing coming up and the Which, money that's going into 75, you know. Well, except well, that, that that may be a, a viable solution because it can use the infrastructure we already have. All right, well, we'll have to see. Well, the barrels will in, be out in there 2030. in 2030. <laughs> Turning now to a program that is helping bring art to schools. You may not realize that a lot of schools have had to scrap art class because of budget cuts and lack of resources. But one group is bringing the creativity back to classrooms across Detroit, including at Edison Elementary School. Take a look. Art really just helps me express my creativity and my feelings. It takes me on a cool adventure. If I did not have art, I probably would not be me. Art Road came about because over 17 years ago, a friend of mine asked me to come to uh, her school and do an art project. I brought a piece of art from when I was little, from fourth grade, and they, one boy stood up and said, Miss Carol, we don't have art. I was just totally stunned. So I volunteered for seven years. And then my husband and I founded Art Road Nonprofit to bring art class back to more schools. Currently, approximately 60 to 70 percent of the schools in Detroit do not have art programs. Education in art is an integral part of development of a human being. Art enhances dignity and help you perform better, not only in art, but in like everything. All of our students may not achieve at the level that we may want them to academically, but art gives them another way to express themselves. It gives them another sense of motivation to come to school, to come in and, and show their talents and for them to feel successful. And so that's why art and, and Art Road has been just a significant component to every day at, at Edison Elementary School. Art Road is a group of amazing partners, volunteers, guest artists that come together and we bring art class back to over 1,200 students three schools that lack art in their curriculum. We raise funds, employ amazing gifted art instructors to actually teach during the curriculum all year long. So the students come down to their art teacher that we employ and they have art class, just like we had when we were little. For today, we're going to do something special with the clay. The kids respond to the art, I think because art touches on such a personal human part of us, they respond in a huge variety of emotions, but mostly they respond with excitement. Art ignites your brain. It, there's so much of your brain 
active when you're creating art. Every children has an innate ability of becoming artist and great artist. For kids, it's like there's no boundaries. They can think outside of the box easily. And sometimes I will like, how do you come up with this project? I'm so amazed by just each of them. What we found is that because they have art class through Art Road, they actually take and carry the projects forward to their own home. I do a lot of stuff, like sometimes I will go online and look for pictures to just paint and stuff. And sometimes me and my brother would just go home and just draw random stuff. Throughout their art, I can feel either like they're angry or they're happy. Like some things like they have in mind can actually transfer into images. I think that helped them to analyze themselves and to interact with their peers. Art has definitely been a, a monumental tool as far as our kids on a, on a, on a social platform. Uh, the students are able to not only express themselves but also share their ideas, their feelings, and it creates a sense of togetherness because students who may not get along they see some commonalities with another student just based on their art projects. I feel happy because I get to be myself and it's a place where I get to hang out with my friends and we all get to have fun in there. They smile a lot. They would show off to me, you know, and then they would just find the volunteer and then like show them the picture they made and they're really proud of it and they're really proud of themselves. And you can tell like from their face and how they do art and really go for it. I think the attitude it's very showing their happiness. I'm going to show you today what happens when you take this cold piece of glass and you heat it up to about 2300 degrees. Art education, what I see in the classroom is I get to see, you know, science in action when you're changing colors or with, you know, the glass melting and you're actually getting to experience those things. It's not just an abstract idea but in art, you get to live that. We come out and we bring a torch and we set up to do a glass blowing demonstration for the kids in the classroom. And we, we like to incorporate a little bit of glass lessons. If you heat it up too quickly, it causes like, it causes stress in the, in the structure of the glass. It'll crack the eye. Bink! We keep it really simple. We either just heat up the glass and like blow a bubble or pull a string of glass and they freak out for it. It's amazing. That reaction just blows us away. Like it feels so good inside to see them just freak out for, you know, simple things that we take for granted. Kids actually peek in the window, the students coming down the hall. That's kind of the energy behind what art class does for these students. Detroit is amazing. Our young artists are gonna be the future designers of the world. All the amazing art that we have done with our signature projects from painted hubcaps, our hubcap collection, to our mascot, our art dogs, to our amazing quilts that we've done in class, to our everyday projects that are just absolutely stunning that we are showing the world visually that art and our students in Detroit matter. I want to have our jazz every day because it is so cool and it just, it really makes me feel good. And if you'd like to see more stories from Detroit Performs, check out our website at dptv.org. And finally, it's that time of year when classic cars hit the streets and thousands of gawkers line Woodward to smell some exhaust and ogle a good paint job. It's the Dream Cruise, and Detroit Public TV is part of it. Coming up next, take a look. Hey, Fred Nahad here, uh, inviting you to join me and our panel of automotive experts, including Bob Lutz and Eric Gorgeous, for a Woodward Dream Cruise Roadshow, August 18th, right here on Detroit Public TV and dptv.org. We'll look at the good, the bad, and the brilliant in Detroit automotive design and check out some serious Motor City muscle from the 50s, 60s, and 70s at the Dream Cruise. So join us at 6 to 9 p.m. right here on Detroit Public TV and dptv.org. Fred off the car. Man, I told you. Bob, let's get to woodworking.
That's the one thing you can never lean on those classic cars. Don't touch them. Don't breathe on them. Just look. Um, you know, since Dream Cruise this weekend, I you know I grew up cruising on Woodward, so I bet you uh, it's did. always fun. Yeah, yeah. What do you guys think? You know, this is a a unique. Detroit event. You yeah. see, you know, the people here are attached to those cars in a different way than perhaps people in other places who have cruises. I mean, <laughs> these folks go out and say, No other my places dad have built... cruises. Yeah. <laughs> it's the <laughs> worst thing in the world. <laughs> um, but, you know, they go out and say, You know, my dad built that car yeah. or I designed yeah. that car. And, you know, they're out there with their kids saying, Yeah, it's, you know, explaining the pieces and what have you it's a it's it's a really connects us to our core industry yeah and it's going to be a lot of fun this weekend all right that's going to do it for us nance it's always good to see you thanks so much for coming in nolan we'll see you again and that's going to do it for my week thanks for spending time with us check out myweek.org for more on the show plus we're on twitter and on facebook have a great week we'll see you next time take care Did you know Roush Enterprises was selected by Google to assemble a test fleet of 100 prototype self-driving cars in 2015. It also produced the new Domino's delivery cars. And speaking of Domino's, Domino's sells well over 2 million pizzas per day around the world and half of their sales are digital. These are just some of the ways Michigan's pioneers started out as small companies with big ideas. We are business leaders for Michigan. We are committed to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Funding is also provided by Delta.